subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button Good evening. Welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Yeshi Chonzo. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you on Friday, the 8th of April. All Indian adults to be eligible for COVID booster doses from April 10. Sri Lanka's finance minister says no alternative to debt restructure amid economic crisis. And. European Parliament strongly condemns education ban for Afghan girls. And now for all the details. India will offer booster doses of COVID-19 vaccine to all adults from April 10. Although free third doses will be limited to frontline workers and those older than 60 who get them at government centres. This comes as the South Asian nation has been witnessing a huge decline in infections in recent days with active caseloads standing at 11,492 as of Friday. India will offer booster doses of COVID-19 vaccine to all adults from Sunday, although free third doses will be limited to frontline workers and those older than 60 who get them at government centres. Adding an extra layer of safety, Health Minister Mansuk Mandavia said in a Twitter post flagging the decision. The country has given 1.85 billion vaccine doses among its population of 1.35 billion. Those older than 18 who received a second dose nine months ago will be eligible for the precaution or booster dose, the Health Ministry said. This is a very welcome news. I think that uh, there was enough clinical data to show that Booster dose is helping people or, and protecting them from infection, reinfection, and also even if they got it, then it was very, very mild. So with the value established, I think the government is, uh, has taken the measured step of saying that, yes, we can start giving booster doses because it will protect the population. With 1,109 new COVID-19 infections logged in the last 24 hours, India as of Friday reported 11,492 active cases. The booster program had started in January, limited to frontline workers and the elderly, administering a total of 24 million doses. When the program is extended on Sunday, those outside these two priority categories will have to pay for the shots at privately run facilities with no mixing and matching of vaccines allowed. The Reserve Bank of India kept its key repo rate at a record low 4% on Friday as expected, as it sought to support economic growth even as inflation edged higher in the aftermath of the Russia-Ukraine war. The central bank said it would restore the width of the liquidity adjustment facility to 50 basis points, seen as a first step to move away from the ultra-loose monetary policy embraced during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Reserve Bank of India's Monetary Policy Committee kept the bank's key leading a repo rate at record low of 4% on Friday as expected as it sought to support economic growth even as inflation edged higher in the aftermath of the Russia-Ukraine war. The reverse repo rate or the key borrowing rate was also kept unchanged at 3.35%. But the central bank said it would restore the width of the liquidity adjustment facility to 50 basis points, which was seen as a first step to move away from the ultra-loose monetary policy embraced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Economic activity, although recovering, is barely above its pre-pandemic level. Against this backdrop, the MPC decided to retain the repo rate at 4%. It also decided to remain accommodative while focusing on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation remains within the target going forward while supporting growth. Inflation has held above the RBI 6% above threshold so far this year, casting doubt on its current strategy of keeping rates low to bolster growth. India's 10-year benchmark bond yield rose above 7% after RBI policy decision. 
while NSC Nifty 50 index was up 0.3%, while the S&P BSE Sensex rose to 0.25%. Traders were also closely watching for any measures to support the bond market in absorbing the government's record $14.31 trillion borrowing program. Pakistan on Friday prepared for the outcome of a no-confidence vote against PM Imran Khan at the weekend after the Supreme Court on Thursday ruled that he had acted unconstitutionally in blocking an attempt to oust him. The parliament will be reconvened on Saturday for the no-confidence motion that could see Khan lose the premiership. Pakistan on Friday prepared for the outcome of a no-confidence vote at the weekend a day after the Supreme Court ruled that Prime Minister Imran Khan had acted unconstitutionally in blocking an attempt to oust him and dissolving the National Assembly. The Parliament will be reconvened on Saturday for the no-confidence motion against Khan. In a tweet late on Thursday, Imran Khan, a former cricket star, said he will fight till the last ball. If Khan, who has lost majority in the Parliament, loses the no-confidence vote, the opposition would be nominating its Prime Minister to govern until August 2023, by when a new election is due. Opposition leader in the National Assembly, Shehbaz Sharif, said after the court ruling that the joint opposition had nominated him to take over should Khan be ousted. Our dictionary is not a victimization in our dictionary. It is not a victimization قانون انصاف اپنا راستہ اپنائے گا اور یہ نہ غیب کا علم ہمیں ہے نہ نیب کا علم ہمیں ہے البتہ نیب نیازی گٹ جوڑ کو ہم توڑ کے رہیں گے انشاءاللہ جس نے پاکستان کو بے پنا نقصان پچھایا ہے The court ruling is the latest twist in a crisis that has threatened political and economic stability in the nuclear armed country of 220 million people with the rupee currency hitting all time lows on Thursday and foreign exchange reserves tumbling. The opposition has said it wants early elections but only after delivering Khan a political defeat. Pakistan's election commission said on Thursday the earliest a new election could be held was October. Sri Lanka's finance minister Ali Sabri said on Friday that the country had no alternative to restructuring its debt as it faces a crippling economic crisis and a political turmoil. The opposition, meanwhile, asked the government to resolve the crisis as soon as possible or face a no-confidence motion. Sri Lanka's Finance Minister Ali Sabri on Friday told the parliament that country had no alternative to restructuring its debt as it faces a crippling economic crisis. Sabri said a hard default is a dangerous situation. Our trade deficit is of about 8 billion US dollars. Political stability was necessary as the country prepared to start talks with the International Monetary Fund this month. Sabri has tendered his resignation as finance minister but the president is yet to accept it. Meanwhile, Sajid Prem Dasa, leader of Sri Lanka's main opposition party, on Friday asked the government to resolve the economic crisis or face a no-confidence motion. The heavily indebted country has little money left to pay for imports which has led to crippling shortages of fuel, power, food and increasingly medicine. 380 rupees earlier, but now it's 625 and the imported milk is almost 800 rupees or even more. For the 400 grams? 400 grams and there are people who are selling them for even 1000 rupees in black market. And we have shortage of this milk and gas and oil and all shortage of food. Street protests have gone on nearly non-stop for more than a month, with doctors and government employees also joining them. President Gotabaya Rajpaksa's various moves, including securing financial support from India and China, have failed to end the shortages and spontaneous street protests. President Gotabaya Rajpaksa is running his administration with only a handful of ministers after his entire cabinet resigned this week. While the opposition and even some coalition partners rejected calls for a unity government to deal with the worst crisis in decades. 
Members of the European Parliament in a statement has expressed their deep concerns over the Taliban's recent decision to indefinitely extend the ban on allowing girls in 7th grade and above to attend school and set the situation of women and girls in the country is steadily deteriorating. They called on the Islamic Emirate to reverse these restrictions. The members of the European Parliament have expressed deep concern over the Taliban's recent decision to indefinitely extend the ban on allowing girls in 7th grade and above to attend school. Girls' schools were scheduled to reopen across Afghanistan after months of closure, but the Taliban backtracked on their previous commitment to open high schools to girls and announced that secondary schools and high schools for girls would remain closed until further notice. This decision was met with strong domestic and international reactions. In a resolution adopted on Thursday, the European Parliament called for a reversal of these restrictions, while noting previous commitments by the Taliban that they would ensure access to education for all citizens. They deplored the steadily deteriorating situation of women and girls in Afghanistan since the Taliban's return to power in 2021. The parliament condemned their persistent focus on erasing women and girls from public life and denying their most fundamental rights including education, work, movement and health care. The European parliament also emphasized that the EU delegation in Kabul re-establishing a minimal presence on the ground for the purpose of coordinating humanitarian aid and monitoring humanitarian situation does not constitute recognition of the Taliban regime by the European Union. The Taliban regime, which took over Kabul in August last year, has curtailed women's rights and freedoms, with women largely excluded from the workforce due to the economic crisis and restrictions. The Nepali Congress, the principal ruling party with Prime Minister Sher Bahadur Dioba at the helm, has forced electoral alliance with its coalition partners, the CPN Maoist Centre and CPN Unified Socialist for the upcoming polls. Earlier, CPN UML chairperson and former Prime Minister KP Sharma Oli told party cadres that the ruling five-party alliance should be swept away in the upcoming local elections. He argued that it is now necessary to defeat the five-party alliance to build the country. According to Oli, Nepal's economy had collapsed within nine months of the UML's exit from the government due to incompetence of the ruling five-party alliance. The local-level elections for all the 753 local units would be held on May 13 in a single phase. Situated amid lush green woods with tracking trails, the Tulip Garden in Sanasar in India's Jammu and Kashmir is attracting nature enthusiasts and tourists from all over the country. The garden has been thrown open for public this week. The splendid aura of bloomed tulips is attracting hundreds of tourists from across the country to hill resort town of Sanasar of India's northern Jammu and Kashmir, dubbed by many as paradise on earth. Surrounded by snow-clad hills and Natha Top Peak in the backdrop, Tulip Garden located adjacent to Sanasar Lake was thrown open for tourists recently with an aim to promote tourism that helps in bolstering local businesses. Sanasar is also an adventure enthusiast haven, offering various activities for tourists such as paragliding, parasailing and horse riding, among others. Tourists are thronging the hill stations of Jammu and Kashmir as they are finding the weather soothing and pleasant. Jammu Gumne Ayabi, Vaishno Devi ke darshan kiye aur phir idhar Natha Top mein snow enjoy kiya aur abhi Sanasar ghumne aaye. Idhar gode ka maza liya, phir abhi idhar boat mein humne shikara ka maza liya. Weather is so cold and so chilled and it's so fun now. And this beauty, this natural beauty is very good. We enjoyed the Tulips Garden. Tourists were also seen riding boats at Sanasar Lake that gives them a great chance to enjoy the serene view of the surroundings. With the easing of pandemic restrictions and improvement in the security situation, tourist footfall is only increasing, which directly creates many jobs in the tourism sector and boosts the region's economy. बहुत गर्मी पड़ रही है इधर बहुत अच्छा मौसम है बाकी टूरिस्ट बहुत अच्छा टूरिस्ट आ रहा है इधर हमारा काम भी बढ़िया चल रहा है बाकी हम यही बोलते हैं कि इधर आए ठंडा मौसम का नजारा मजा ले Along with horticulture and agriculture tourism is an important industry for Jammu and Kashmir contributing about 7% to its economy according to government data 
tourist arrival are set to touch a 10-year high this year after more than 340,000 tourists have come to the region since January, according to government officials. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash Newsline and follow us on Twitter at Newsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time next week. Have a great weekend. Good night. Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India.